Good morning. What a beautiful fall day we've been given, isn't it? I hope you all are enjoying this weather. It's not nice when your air conditioner or your heater has to kick on because the weather's just, just right out there. Well, I hope that you have picked up one of our bulletins this morning and you open to the inside front cover because it gives you a full page presentation of what our gospel meeting will be starting next, this, well, actually this coming Saturday night. Now you'll remember that we will not have the early service. The service will be, will be canceled next week as we all meet together because of Restore. But it gives you a full schedule and I just want to highlight a few things. First of all, the three speakers that we have coming. One is Bill Stewart. He works with the Bear Valley Bible Institute of Denver. That's one of the institutions, one of the schools that we're going to be looking to to try to find some of our resident ministers to apply for our program that we're so excited will begin here uh, come this next year. And Bill has been very helpful in that effort. He's well known in this area. He's from the Boone Hill of Missouri. Preached a lot in churches around here. And, and I know that you'll really, really enjoy Bill. The other one is Chris Swinford. Chris Swinford is is the vice president right now, but he's the one who's being handed the reins. And as soon as Trinidad retires as the director of Sunset International Bible Institute, formerly Sunset School of Preaching in Texas, Chris will take over in that role. He's a world missionary, travels all over the globe, has been to all the continents except for Antarctica, and he is a fabulous preacher. I know that you'll thoroughly enjoy his presentation. That's also one of the schools that we're going to be looking to for possible resident ministers. So we're going to have him as well. And then we have Kevin Swagger. And I'm really excited to have Kevin. As I mentioned before, Kevin is a convert from being a minister in a denominational church. And he was a fifth generation in that particular faith. And he was, he met my dad at a conference and they got to talking and studying by email. And after about a year's time, he was baptized in Christ, got up to preach the gospel in his own pulpit, and because of the gospel and his presentation, he was let go from his job, and then asked to move out of the preacher's home within a couple of weeks. And so because of his faith, he suddenly found himself unemployed and homeless. And then, of course, he, he, he came and, and started working in the Lord's Church and has done a great job. He's now a pulpit minister in Corona, California. But he's got a great story. And if they, you have any friends or neighbors in the denominational world, any family members who just don't understand what the church is all about and the message that we're trying to communicate, Kevin Swagger can communicate that message in a way that those of us who've grown up in the church can because of his experiences and his background and his love for folks that are his family even that are still in the denominational world. So if you'd like to bring folks to his classes, especially Wednesday night, he's going to address his story specifically. Now, there's also themes throughout the week. Brother Swinford is going to be talking about Jesus is here through his commission and talking about evangelism and reaching out through mission work and also through local evangelism. And that's where all of his speeches and classes will focus on the whole week. Brother Bill Stewart is going to talk about how Jesus is here through our worship. He's going to talk about all the different aspects of worship and the importance of it. What it means to us in regard to one another and also what it means in regard to our relationship with God. And all of his classes and his keynote will address that topic. And finally, Kevin Swagger is going to talk about how Jesus is here through his word. And he's going to discuss, you know, how the word of God affected him and changed him and caused him to see the light, so to speak, and how it can do that for others. So please be looking at that schedule, see what, what topics most, most affect your life, and then be making your selections. Also invite your friends and neighbors who want to be able to have a great, great restore meeting. This morning we're going to talk about the subject of identity. You know, it's often been said that the three pertinent questions of existence are where do I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? And really, everyone has to be faced with those questions at some point in their life. And we all have to try to answer it. And people answer it in so many different ways. First of all, they may, when it comes to origins, they may turn to 
God, or they may turn to some other uh, perceived deity. Or they may turn to, you know, science or atheism or a whole, a whole gambit of different approaches. But mankind still tries to find out where they came from, why he's here. And then they question why. What is the meaning of my life? Well, there's so many different ways that people in our world try to answer that question. They answer it through philosophy. They answer it through career. They answer it through family. In all different ways, people come up with their own individual definition of why. But then there's the question, where am I going? And what a, what a haunting, haunting question that is. Because we look at the grave that which threatens and one day will engulf every one of us. And we ask what is beyond. But really those questions are questions of identity. Who am I? What's my life all about? A famous comedian made a statement that I thought was quite, you know, I'm trying to be funny, but I thought quite profound. She said, I've always wanted to be somebody. I see now that I should have been more specific. And that simply speaks to the idea that you look at our life, everybody is somebody. But what does that mean? Who are you? Who am I? I mean, it's, it's root. Not what do you do. Not necessarily what are you good at. Not necessarily who are you married to or who are your children. But I mean, who are you? At its core root, what is the answer to the question? You see, this question and its answer affect every aspect of our lives. Self-esteem can greatly affect our lives. And you, can, you see those folks who are successful. And what's interesting is some of the most successful people are not necessarily some of the smartest people. And they're not necessarily some of the most talented people. They simply have an idea and an understanding and a, and a self-esteem that says that they are worth something. That you can take someone who is, is super intelligent and talented and gifted and charismatic and take someone else who has far less of all of those attributes but if this one doesn't know who he is and doesn't have a sense of self-esteem and worth and value, and the other one does, he will, even though he is inferior in all these different qualities, the one who believes in himself will be the success in life. Isn't that right? Haven't you seen that over and over and over? So this question of identity is really important in how we live. But now when it comes to our faith, our spirituality, this idea of identity is even more important. It's even more essential. Because if we don't know who we are in relation to God and eternity, then we will never, ever meet our spiritual potential. You see, the world defines the idea of identity in many different ways, but there are three that are very visible in our world. The first is this. The world says, I am what I do. I am what I do. Who I am and what my life is, is defined by what I am able to accomplish in my life. Now when I talk about this one, it would apply to all of us, generally, but fellas, you know, this is one that we struggle with. I've struggled with this. Allowing the world at times in my life to, to misidentify in my own heart what my life is supposed to be. Because we become driven. And we become about achievement and goals and meeting those goals. Because we feel that in some way, who I am is fully defined by the things that I accomplish or, on the negative side, the things that I fail in. You see, productivity is the very fuel of this philosophy. Socially, this identity can fail us as a person eventually is always going to fall 
should. See, every person, even those who achieve the very most, even those who seem like they have nothing but mountaintops when it comes to their effort in life, they still at some point come to the bottom of the valley. Jim Pavano, who was North Carolina's basketball coach, found out that he was terminally ill with spinal cancer at the age of 47. And as he reflected on his life and his short time left and his career, he was interviewed and, and they talked about his life and he had any regrets. And he said, well, I, I really regret when I was 23 years old. I was coaching a small college team and, and I, we, we had a game where we lost and, and the boys were just absolutely just beating themselves up. And he said, I was giving them a speech and I was hard and I was just demeaning to them. And they said, well, coach, what more did you want us to do? We did our best. And he said, don't you know that the score is what defines you? You lose, ergo, you are a loser. He said, I live my life under that philosophy. That if you lose, you're a loser. If you win, you're a winner. And that is the very essence of this idea that I am what I do. When I win, I'm a winner. When I lose, I'm a loser. That the results of my effort are what defines me as a person. Folks, the reality is, is that if we're defined by our efforts, that all of our success, that all of our identity, that all of our self-esteem can be swept away by our next failure. We look at scripture and we see that spiritually, this idea, this definition is tragically disastrous. Because we spiritually are failures. In fact, it is our great skill as human beings, spiritually speaking, to fail. If you were to look at, at that which identifies the human race from the time they fell in the Garden of Eden to this very moment, men are epic failures. In fact, if you look honestly in the mirror of your own life, when it comes to that which in the spiritual world is the definition of succeeding, Holiness versus sin. Is there any sin there? Is there any failure there? That's why we have passages like Romans chapter 3, 23 that tells us that no one certain tears for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23 tells us for the wages of sin is death. And the Apostle Paul himself in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 11, the great apostle, the one that we look to as our spiritual counselor and guide, he would say of himself in verse 11, for sin taking opportunity through the commandment deceived me, and though it killed me, so the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and the righteousness is good. Therefore, did that which is good become become a cause of death for me, may it never be. For rather it was sin in order that I might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good. That through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. You see, he's pointing out that this, this effort to be perfect spiritually is always going to fall short. He says, in fact, that standard preaches to me this message every day. The law stands so that we we'll understand, so that we will have a conscious idea that we cannot be perfect. That the idea of success being tied to winning spiritually will always tear us apart. Then he concludes in that verse 14 where he says, Well, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into the bondage of sin. If we define our lives, both socially, but especially spiritually, 
but I am what I do, that the definition will be poor indeed. The second way that the world defines identity is I am what people think of me. Now, if it were true that number one is particularly difficult, although it would apply to men and ladies alike, it's particularly difficult for men, I think we would agree that this one's particularly difficult for some of you ladies. And some of us men struggle with it also. But this idea of image. I am what people think of me. I am what they perceive. How much of this world is invested in having a self-esteem that is rooted in causing others to have a certain perception about the way we look, about the things we have, about how intelligent we are, about how important our job may be, about how perfect our children might be. There's so many ways in which we try to fulfill this world's definition of value and worth. See, the pressure of perceived identity is one of life's most stressful things. Because the reality is, is I can't control what you think of me. And you can't control what I think of you. All you can do is be who you are. And we can try to manipulate and, and give certain impressions but at the end of the day, it is out of our hands. You know, the greatest example of this in Scripture to me, and this is a strange statement to make, but I almost feel sorry for them, is the Pharisees. They were the ultimate group who wanted others to think of them a certain way. In fact, in our text, Matthew chapter 23, 25 through 29, that starts off in verse 25, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of robbery and self-indulgence. Now, I like that word robbery there, because in the Greek, it's from the word harpage. And that word is the same word used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, where Jesus is talking about his return. And he says, those of us who are righteous will be caught up with him in the air. So it can be translated not only robbery, but that idea of being caught up or catching up. And when you think about people who are always worried about what others think of them, they are caught up in that. They are always trying to catch everyone's attention. Always trying to capture a certain image or idea or vision of who they are. And you talk about stressful. He'll go on to talk about the Pharisees. He says, you're whitewashed tombs. That on the outside you put on this great show, this great image. That you're in this beautiful, beautiful structure, but inside you're nothing but a graveyard. You wash the outside of the cup, but the inside is filthy. And you'll talk in other places about how they'll go out and perform men. They'll pray these elegant prayers for men to hear. They're not spiritual inside. It's all about what people think. And honestly, how easy is it for us to get caught up in that same idea, in that same definition of who we are? How very refreshing it is to know that we only have one that we have to please. There was a popular religious song put out a few years ago that had a line in it that I thought was so profound. It said, make peace with God and make peace with yourself. Because in the end, there's nobody else. Hopefully we can listen to those words. Number three. We see this one every day as well. The world defines identity by I am what I have. I am what I have. This is everywhere. The idea of wanting things. To possess things. That our image of what we have is somehow a marker of success and achievement. 
This is the opposite of the biblical thing of contentment. You see the scriptures, I was listening to the radio coming back from the airport yesterday, and I heard a preacher, I was generally shocked on preachers, and it doesn't take me long sometimes to turn it again, but this one was talking about that, that money is the root of all evil. That's not what the scriptures said. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Almost every one of the great heroes of the Old Testament was pretty wealthy by the standards of their day. But what made them a success was that those things at the end of the day didn't matter to them. They had a different way of identifying themselves. They didn't believe that they were what they had. They had that sense of self-esteem and worth from something else, which was their relationship with the Lord. The commandment in Scripture, whether we have everything the world has to offer, or none of those things is the idea of contentment. And it's the idea of greed and defining ourselves by what we have. It's the very opposite, the very antithesis of what it means to be content. We look over at Paul's words in Philippians 4. Philippians 4, 11 through 13, and, and his words there are very powerful. Because he says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content with whatever circumstances I am in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of fit, being filled and going hungry, of having abundance and suffering need, for I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. We all want to pull that last verse out of this context, but it is specifically talking about the ability to be content. That I can be content through Him who strengthens me. We need to be people who identify ourselves not by what we have. So if we are not identified by what we do or by what people think of us or by what we have, what should be our standard of identity? Whose we are. The Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Paul in this great encouraging chapter says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption. And as sons we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children. You know, in the ancient feudal systems of Europe, there were different classes. There was the peasant class, there was the commoner class, and there was the noble class. And you would assume that nobles were always wealthy and always had a lot, but there were some who weren't. In fact, there were some nobles who had very little because their father had squandered their fortune away. But you could always tell a noble because he always had a different gait. He always walked a little bit straighter. He always had a sense of pride and dignity. And it wasn't because of anything that he had. And it wasn't because of what anybody thought of him. Because frankly, when you have nothing, people often don't think well of you at all. It wasn't necessarily what he had achieved. It was because of who he was born. That is who we are. I'm going to say, no matter what you think of me, I have value because He loves me. No matter what I do or what I don't do, I have worth because He thinks that I have worth. Regardless of what I have in this life, makes no difference because of what He It's not about who we are, but who's we are. This morning, if you have been defining your life in the wrong way, if you've been allowing this world's definitions to determine your identity, make a change today. If you need to come to Christ and be baptized into his name, become a member of the Lord's church and start the new, or if you just need to remember again that which you 
refuse to know who you really are, who you really are. I'm right down as we see it.